the first sort of principle of clean code that I hear quoted a lot that, frankly, I don't fully agree with is this idea of only ever having one return statement. So here we have this function find user by name, and all it does is it takes in this array of users and a name, and it just iterates through the users until it finds a user with this name and it returns that user. Otherwise, at the end, it returns null. Now, some people will argue that this has two different return statements, and that's not a good thing. So the sort of solution to this, and I'll just copy this entire function, would be to not have the extra return statement. So the way we can do that is by saying let's, and let's call this found user, is going to be equal to null initially. And we're going to simply return our found user instead of null at the end. Instead of this return statement, we're going to update found user. So we can say found user is going to be users at i. And I understand the reasoning behind this, being that we want to have one exit point from the function. And oftentimes this is true and it leads to better code, but also oftentimes it leads to worse code. Like you might have not noticed that the change I just made actually made this code less efficient. What I mean by that is that this version of the code is going to stop when it finds the user. However, this version is still going to have to iterate through the entire array. Now, this might not be a huge issue, and even if it is an issue, you can simply add a break statement and it's no longer a big issue anymore. But now I would argue you've actually made the code less readable by having this extra break statement. But also what would happen if say you wanted to have a guard clause? So say before any of this, you wanted to say if the name is equal to null, then we simply want to return null. But now we have an extra return statement. This would be fine in the original version of the function, but in this version where we say we only have one return statement, we no longer are allowed to do this. We could of course get these same results by not having this, but now if the user is null, we're still going to iterate through the entire loop for no reason. And if we put it back, we could try something like setting some Boolean flag that's like skip over the for loop, but that's definitely less readable. So essentially my point with this one is yes, in most cases, try to have a single return statement, but that doesn't mean that's always going to be the case. Sometimes you want to use guard clauses with return statements there, and sometimes it just makes more logical sense to have multiple return statements. And if that's the case, don't feel like you can't do that. And by the way, all of the examples in this video come from different books and blog posts about what clean code is that I either disagree with or that I think are oftentimes sort of misunderstood. Additionally, a few of them come from more anecdotal experience with some of my own students and mistakes I've seen them making, as well as just newer developers in general. Next, I wanna look at what's called the dry principle, meaning don't repeat yourself. And I think this is by far the most misused principle in all of software engineering. So here we have two functions, calculate discount and calculate tax. Both of them take in a price and return price times 0.1. So this is representing a 10% discount, and this represents a 10% tax. So you might say, okay, I've been told not to repeat myself, not to repeat my code. So what I'm going to do is add another function that's going to be calculate 10%. And this is going to take in some price, and it's going to do the same thing. So it's simply going to return this price times 0.1. And then we could use this function instead of ever needing to use these functions. But I don't actually think this is a good idea. And this is not even what the dry principle is supposed to mean. This is a misunderstanding of that principle. What I mean by that is that the dry principle is meant to say, do not repeat business logic. Don't have the same logic appearing in multiple places in the code base. But that doesn't mean you can't just coincidentally have the same line of code in multiple places. Calculating a discount and calculating a tax are two different things. It is just a coincidence that in this case, a discount is the same rate as a tax. But if say later down the line, we decided that we wanted the discount to change, but taxes are still the same, well, now we would have to delete this function and go back to these functions so that the numbers could be different, or maybe we could add some parameter for it, but regardless, we couldn't just stick with this function we have here. So in my mind, this is a bad refactor, and I think an easy way to determine that is that there is a good chance that sometime down the line, we're going to have to unrefactor the code because it is controlling multiple things that are not actually related to each other on a business logic level. One thing I see a lot with beginner programmers is this tendency to over comment absolutely everything. And I think it comes from a good place because as a beginner, you have a harder time understanding what code does. So the expectation is, so does everybody else. So I should try to make it as easy to understand as possible, but actually it sort of does the opposite of that. So for example, we have this calculate rectangle area function that takes in a width and a height. 
And obviously this is going to take those numbers and return to us the area of this rectangle. And that's sort of what this comment says it's going to do. But this is just redundant with the name of the function and the parameters. It's very obvious what this is going to do. So we don't need to say calculate the area of a rectangle because that's literally the name of the function. Then we can also remove takes the width and height of the rectangle and returns the area. I don't think this is necessary either. You could make an argument for we should be commenting on what this return type is going to be, especially in JavaScript, because there's no way in the function declaration without TypeScript to actually declare that this is going to be returning some number and what exactly that is. But I think it's sort of obvious and unnecessary. And then we have this implementation detail of how the multiplication works. And this just doesn't matter. A top level comment, if it's going to be there, should be to give context to whoever's going to be using this function for how exactly they should use it. But you don't need to know the implementation details of how the function works to understand how to use the function. So I think this is unnecessary as well. If you wanted to have some short comment here, you could. But overall, I just don't think this top level comment is necessary. And then all of these comments inside of the function, they're very obvious. They just say exactly what the code does. So honestly, I would remove all of these and only leave comments if they're there to explain something that's not obvious. You need to assume that whoever's reading your code already knows how to code. So you don't need to tell them what the multiplication symbol does. You don't need to tell them what a for loop does. You don't need to tell them all of these basic things. And I think you should only use comments as sort of a last resort when there's some logic that you think is particularly complicated that somebody might not understand. And in that case, it could be a good idea to explain it to them in a comment. But even then, that could be an indication that maybe there's a better way to write that code where it's just easy to understand to begin with. Also, I think it's worth noting that this code could be much simpler if we just made this all one line like this. So it's simply, area is width times height. And then we have this if check down here and return the area. And I think that becomes more clear when you start removing the comments. So when we had all of those comments, it probably wasn't super obvious, at least immediately, that we had sort of this extra line of code for no reason. So just be careful and make sure you're not using comments to justify bad decisions, but rather just to explain necessary but complex logic. Next, I wanna talk about the idea of having 100% test coverage, which is something a lot of development teams actually strive for. It's something I've worked on teams that are working towards, but frankly, I think it's a bad goal. I think it's misguided because it sort of implies that at 100% test coverage, we are testing everything. But the way we actually measure test coverage is not that. Test coverage is usually measured by are we actually touching every line of code with our tests? But that doesn't mean that we actually test every potential case. So for example, here we have this process input command function that takes in some input, it trims the input. If the input is help, we return this blank help. If it is exit, we return exiting application. Otherwise, we return unknown command. And then we have some tests down here. And this has 100% test coverage because we have a test for every if check in here to make sure that we are reaching all of the code, but it doesn't test every possible case. So we would say, okay, we've tested everything. We have 100% test coverage. So therefore our tests are amazing. We can move on. But what if say we got some input that was all capital letters? What are we supposed to do about that? What should happen? Well, we don't have a test to test for that. And that's potentially an actual bug in this code. So we should have a test for that. But the idea of 100% test coverage doesn't tell us to do that. So does this mean that 100% test coverage is a bad goal? Not necessarily, but also I think it can be a bit misguided. And I think it's important to put it in context and recognize that 100% test coverage does not mean that 100% of test cases are covered. It simply means that 100% of the code is going to be touched by a test. And oftentimes, I think it's frankly a waste of time. Not every single line of code needs to be touched by a test. And much more important is having tests that encompass both these sort of happy cases and a bunch of different edge cases. Next, let's talk about the idea of premature optimization. I get comments all the time on my videos about how something I did is inefficient. And yes, I write inefficient code all the time. And that's okay. In fact, that's oftentimes better. So for example, here we have this find largest number function and it returns math.max and it spreads this numbers array. So we can see it takes in these numbers. And in this case, the largest number is 204. So that's what it returns. And somebody might say, you probably shouldn't be using these spread operator on this numbers array, especially if it's super big, this could be very slow. So maybe instead we should use this version of the function down here. So this version just uses a traditional for loop and just iterates through the numbers array and it finds the max that way and then returns it at the end. 
And is this more efficient? I don't know, maybe a little bit. I don't know exactly how math.max is implemented or exactly the overhead of the spread operator in comparison to everything we're doing here. But the point is that it just doesn't matter. This code, I think, is easier to read. This code, I think, was easier to write. This code, I think, was more concise. So why would we go with this code down here? The only reason for it is potentially that it's more performant. But does that performance make any difference? Is it solving some performance bottleneck? Probably not. And this isn't an excuse to write super inefficient code all of the time, but rather to avoid trying to make all of these micro optimizations that may or may not make a difference when instead you could focus on actual performance bottlenecks, which tend to be much more high level. They tend to be things like making extra trips to the server or to databases, or sometimes even at the code level, they can be things like having extra nested loops or having an inefficient algorithm of some kind or having a bad choice of data structure. But they almost never come from these tiny little micro optimizations. And oftentimes you're just making code less readable and more bug prone. Next, I want to talk about what some people call an infinite pursuit of perfection that usually comes from over refactoring. So here we have this calculate total function that takes in the items from some order as well as a tax rate. And it's just going to loop through the items and total up their prices, as well as include the added tax based on that tax rate, and then return the total. And somebody might say, oh, I can refactor this, and I can use the reduce function instead. So we can do this version of it instead. And that's fine. We can use reduce. I think this is potentially a cleaner way to essentially sum up these items. That's perfectly fine. And I would argue that this is potentially even a better solution. But then somebody might say, well, we can make this a little bit better. So let's, instead of doing it that way, let's do it this way by having two functions. Let's add an add tax function and have the reduce like this. So we still have the reduce, but instead of this item.price times one plus tax rate, we make this its own function for adding the tax. And then we just add tax like this by calling the function here. And you might say, okay, this is a little bit easier to read but we could make it even more generic. So let's make it generic like we do down here. So the generic version is going to be very similar, but now we have this sort of wrapper around reduce and we have add tax to item price, which is essentially the same thing, but it's taking the item dot price instead of just taking in the price. And then we have calculate total, which is going to use our generic reduce operation as well as our add tax to item price function and it's going to return the same result. I would argue that each step of this made this code less readable, not more. I think the first step was probably good when we changed it to use reduce. And you could make an argument for this step, although I don't think this add tax function was necessary. I think it's just sort of adding complexity for no reason. And then by the time we tried to make it more generic, I think we objectively made the code substantially harder to read. So is it good to refactor code and to have generic code and all of these things? Sure, yes, it is. But also you can definitely go too far and it's something I see a lot, so just be careful with it. Next, I wanna talk about this idea that short functions should always be better. And I don't think that's necessarily true. So here we have this get user full name function, takes in a user, it then has this capitalized function inside of it, and it gets the first name and the last name, which it capitalizes, then it returns the first name plus the last name as a string. And I think this is fine. Maybe you could argue that capitalize could be moved out if you want to, if it's going to be reused in different places. But frankly, I think this get user full name function is perfectly fine. But some people might say, oh, but we should sort of move all of these different components out of the function. And you could end up with something like this, a get first name function that gets the first name from a user, a get last name function, a capitalized function, a get full name function that combines the first name and last name and adds that space in between. And then we have the full get user full name function that takes in the user object, calls the create full name function, and calls inside of there capitalize and get first name and get last name. But I think we're just over complicating things. Now, if I just want to understand this function, I have to go find this function, which right now is right here, but you could imagine as this gets more complex, it's going to be a little bit more effort to find exactly where it is. Sure, you can use your IDE to find it, but you're just gonna have to be going back and forth to understand what this function does. And then you're going to need to understand what this one does, and this one does, and this one does to sort of understand this function versus in this one, it's all right here. And it's not like it's hard to read. It's not incredibly long. It's not some 50 line function. It's actually the same length as this one, 
Although you could put this on one line if you wanted to, but I just don't think this code is more readable. Maybe you could make some kind of argument for it, but frankly, I think it's at best equal in readability and just a lot more work to write the code this way. If we had a class, maybe it would make sense to have these getter functions and to have this create full name function all as methods on the class. But as top level functions, I think this is just completely overkill. Next, I want to talk about the single responsibility principle as it relates to object oriented programming, which generally says that a class should only have one reason to change, or at least that's the way it's oftentimes quoted. But I think a much better way to describe the principle and sort of the essence of what it's supposed to represent is that a class should only have one purpose. So here we have a logger class with a few methods. We have log, we have create message, format message, and write log. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but they're all related to logging. But you might say, okay, but what if I wanted to change one of these things, but not the others? Well, then clearly this isn't a single responsibility for this one class, so I should break it up. And that's what this code down here does. So let's uncomment this. And now we have all of these smaller classes, log message creator, log message formatter, log writer, and we can see they're all sort of used together. But what's the point of this? These classes are closely related to each other. And we're ending up with all of these sort of micro fragmented classes, which I just don't think is a good idea. And I don't think the original class ever actually violated the single responsibility principle because this class up here its purpose is for logging. It has one responsibility, and that's logging. Does it have multiple methods? Sure, it does. Most classes will have multiple methods. That's fine. But they're all related to a single purpose. So while those methods might have individual responsibilities within the class, the overall class has one responsibility and one purpose, and that's more of what actually matters. Now, we've talked a lot about some clean code principles that I just don't agree with. But if you want to see some that I do agree with, you should watch this video next.